is, is this is actually the fourth presentation because they gave the first presentation twice. And I noticed they get better. I should give this, you know, another three more times and I'll probably begin to understand what I'm talking about. That's, that's one of the main reasons to uh, give lectures uh, or it has been in my life. But uh, this is part three and uh, you recognize the uh, usual suspects here, Born, Heisenberg, Dirac, and Schrodinger. Uh, much of what I'm going to talk about today has to do more with Dirac and Schrodinger than Born and Heisenberg. And what I would hope to get to today is uh, take you to uh, the issue of what we call non-locality, uh, the, the failure of what we think of as local realism in quantum mechanics. Uh, it's, it's actually built into the theory. And it's the, the reason we like the theory is it seems to represent the real world quite well. Um, I thought that some, some uh, so, so in the first three parts, on the first part, I was talking mainly about wave particle duality. And I wanted uh, that, uh, I wanted to bring that out to you because it makes clear uh, that there's something very unusual about nature if you have to use quantum mechanics to describe it. And what we saw was that uh, objects like uh, waves of light would sometimes behave like particles and we call them photons. Whereas something which we had always thought of as a particle, the electron had wave-like properties under certain circumstances. And I'm not sure if I made it really clear, but it is interesting that nature is constructed so that the wave-like properties and particle-like properties can never be manifested at the same time. You, you can't make uh, electrons behave like particles at the same time that they're behaving like waves. Something is going on. You have to give up some, uh, some aspect of perception of what you're looking at. Uh, the, and, and what it is, is um, there's a kind of playoff of localization against spatial distribution. Waves are spread out in space. Particles are localized and it, what it turns out is nature is constructed so that if you if you actually localize something and make it and and see it as a particle then you cannot have at the same time the spatially distributed properties which are characteristic of a wave and conversely um, now part two which was the last time that i spoke about quantum mechanics is uh I was trying to show you how uh, that in a bound system, say like an electron in an atom, uh, there cannot be just any arbitrary energy. The, the energies uh, turn out to be rather definite and particular to the system. So an electron around a proton, which is a hydrogen atom, will have certain well-defined energies that the system can have, but it won't have others. Now, uh, that's not the whole story, but that's an important part of the story. And I'll review that in a minute. And then where we are today is uh, part three. And I'm going to talk about quantum states. I've been using the word and, you know, it's, it's almost uh, an axiom uh, that there's something called a state. And we talk about it as though we knew what it was. Um, that turns out to be a little, little more difficult and tricky, uh, especially when we talk about the superposition of states. You know, I, I think I gave an example of uh, waves on a string and uh, and, and we saw that waves on a string uh, could be represented by sort of what we call the, the uh, well, very uh, distinct separate solutions, uh, you know, a, a half of a sine wave that went from end to end of a tied of a, of a string tied at both ends, or the whole uh, sine wave, or uh, three halves of a sine wave and so on. And that you can make up any shape of uh, deformation of that string 
by adding together these uh, fundamental frequencies. Something like that happens in quantum mechanics, but with some differences that are very shocking and still cause people uh, problems, but they're very interesting differences. And it has come to us that there may be a technology in these dis differences. And you, you've heard about it. I mean, people talk about quantum information and they're talking about uh, encryption that's unbreakable. And they're talking about new algorithms that might enable, <laughs> might enable the computer, might enable computers to break the current levels of encryption. Uh, and there's a lot of excitement. There's so much excitement that uh, there has something called NQIA. And that's a story all in itself, but you probably, you should have heard some echoes of it, although I have to say, I was slow to be aware of it. But I don't know if you know, uh, in, uh, uh, okay, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, quantum information and NQIA. So that, that'll be uh, something for later. I, I thought also, um, you might like some readings. I mean, Cindy was saying once that she found what I said inter interesting enough, so she went out to see what else she could find about it. And so here are here are two books that uh, I think are quite. The, the first half of each is quite good. Uh, it will tell you kind of what the basic features of quantum mechanics are, and will make clear what's strange about those features. And I think it justifies the strangeness by pointing out how well it uh, represents what we see in nature. Then, uh, and, and so the books are by Michael Raymer, uh, Quantum Physics, What Everyone Needs to Know. I got it out of the library here and read it a couple of weeks ago. And Carlo Rovelli, this was recommended to me by my uh, son-in-law's mother, uh, who, uh, has probably never had a science course in her life, but she she liked it. Uh, I read it. Uh, as I say, he, he writes beautifully. Uh, the first 40 pages are, I think, a brilliant description of quantum theory. Uh, and then he, he kind of goes off where I'm never comfortable uh, talking about the attempts to create intellectual frameworks, philosophical frameworks almost, that make sense out of quantum mechanics. And uh, I'm, I'm, I always get uneasy. You, you use the word epistemology in front of me and I'll either uh, fall asleep immediately or get out of the room as soon as I can. Um, and Ravelli devotes a lot of his book to philosophical issues. And, uh, and I have to say, you know, it's kind of surprising to read a book even with philosophy and quantum theory uh, where he's quoting Vladimir Lenin and Alexander Bogdanov. Uh, Lenin, of course, uh, the chief Bolshevik of the uh, Russian Revolution, and Alexander Bogdanov was a philosopher, uh, kind of a uh, kind of an interesting guy. Uh, got interested in and uh, did early work on blood transfusion, as well as writing uh, philosophical critiques of imperial, what was it, imperial physicism or something like that. Anyway, not, not that part is not my kind of stuff, but the first parts of each of these books available from the library, really good. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, I recommend uh, chapter 20, Entanglement and Non-Locality in this uh, very unusual uh, physics textbook called Modern Introductory Physics, uh, of which I am an author. And you can get it as a download from Springer for way more money than I would ever want to pay. So maybe that's not a serious recommendation. But here, here's a recommendation that's really quite uh, 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 unusual. And it is uh, Dirac, Paul, Adrian, Maurice Dirac, the Principles of Quantum Mechanics, fourth edition. Uh, the first edition came out in 1930. You know, that's like three years after the invention of quantum mechanics. And it's a fully worked out description of quantum theory in the language of linear algebra. 
So right away, you probably don't want to, you, you got to be on, well, you got to be wary. And it has a notation for states, which are called the bra, and you have a right angle with a, some kind of a state symbol in here and a vertical bar and a ket. Uh, and, uh, and you can see what happens because fairly often you write the bra and the ket facing each other. And now you have a bracket. Very clever. It's invented by Dirac, but it is now widely used in physicists. So he, he, the book that's in the book. And I say beyond page 14, the book is for professionals. But the first 14 pages explain the need for quantum mechanics uh, and they provide insightful non-mathematical descriptions of the unusual features of the theory. Here's an example. Uh, uh, with, you know, let me, let me just, before I give the example, say I was really struck by uh, after, what is it? I don't know, I've been doing quantum mechanics at some level 40 years, 50 years, 60, no, 65 years, let's say. And, uh, uh, and I read this 14 pages and I thought, oh my gosh, there it is. It's all right there. Why didn't I just read that 14 pages 65 years ago? Uh, well, the answer is I probably did. And it didn't mean a thing to me then, but now it's very meaningful. And he's telling you there is an unavoidable indeterminacy in the calculation of observational results. This is what Feynman uh, tells us as he's talking about quantum mechanics. He's telling us that uh, he's telling us that um, unlike classical physics, you now have a world in which you can set up an experiment. Uh, you can have all the apparatus and all the input parameters exactly the same, and you run the experiment twice and you get different results. Now that is not the way classical physics works. But that surely is the way quantum mechanics works. And there's this, uh, it turns out that when you make a measurement uh, on most quantum systems, you will get a result uh, and you won't know what it means until you've made uh, a thousand similar measurements and seen what the distribution of answers is that comes out of it. You'll get one answer sometime, you'll get another answer other times and so on. You make a, you have to make a, graph of the distribution and that then begins to characterize the system uh, so that you can predict what's going to happen the next time. You, well, you can never predict what's going to happen the next time, but you can predict what the likelihood is. And, uh, and he talks about superposition and states uh, of, uh, and polarization of photons. And he talks about superposition and interference of photons. Each photon interferes only with itself. Interference between two different photons never occurs. That's often big news to people who aren't familiar with quantum mechanics. But in part one, we looked at several interferometers and uh, ended up seeing, we saw electron interference happening one electron at a time. And we saw a photon interference happening one, one photon at a time. And then he, he talks about the superposition of states. Well, I, I am just telling you these things right now because that's where I hope to go by the end of the lecture, the lecture, the end of the talk. But before we get there, I wanna talk a little bit about NQIA. Anybody here know about NQIA? I can't see anybody. I've, I've listened to Steve and so I've lost my, okay. No, I need an answer. Somebody tell me whether they have. Uh, nobody's ever heard. Nobody's ever heard of it. Okay, thank you. Oh, right. There you go, Jerry. Right. All right, at least I know somebody's out there heard me. So here it is: the National Quantum Initiative Act of 2018, passed by Congress, uh, along with 2.6 billion dollars. You know, you can you can get a lot of quantum initiative for 2.6 billion. And uh, in fact, there is now a. Uh, uh, a URL, quantum.gov. So there's, I mean, there is a federal website for quantum stuff. Uh, you can go to quantum.gov and there's a fact sheet. You can get a fact sheet about this. And, and if you do go there, you will learn that uh, um, um, there's a lot of things going on for this money. Uh, among them are the establishment of national quantum coordination office, 
the NQCO in the White House with its own seal. How about that? Now that's how you know you're something serious. Let's see. And so you can see the seal. Uh, you, you'll, you'll notice, in fact, there's a, uh, if you go online, you can find somewhere a, a lovely gloss uh, or maybe exegesis, exegesis of the seal. Quantum Coordination Office, National Quantum Coordination Office. And it has three, six, nine, 12, 13 stars. Those are not for the original colonies. Those are for the 13 agencies that the NQCO is supposed to coordinate. And uh, the, uh, uh, and, but what I like, the thing I like particularly, the reason I wanted you to see this seal big is that you see the eagle here. That's of course our, our, ben Franklin wanted it to be a turkey, but uh, we went for the eagle because it shows how peace loving we are. Um, anyway, that there, that vertical bar and over here at the right angle, that's a cat. And so the eagle is being displayed here in a Dirakian cat. Uh, so these, these are people in touch with reality. Charlie, when the when the Congress voted to fund this, do you think that any single congressman had any idea what they were voting for? Well, there were at least two physicists. I don't know what the what the question the still is. stands. Yeah, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I really don't. I mean, I didn't even know about this thing. Uh, do you know we now have a World Quantum Day uh, because how long does it last? <laughs> one day you mean <laughs> well people are uncertain you know <laughs> like one day on average <laughs> on average on average it lasts a day yeah anyway i thought that was quite wonderful that there is this stuff and my god there is a lot of bureaucracy set up with it i mean um uh, there is now a quantum part of, you know, part of this thing is there's a quantum consortium.org. You can go and look it up. It has a national Q through 12 educational partnership. There's a quantum information science research centers, the QIS. There are quantum economic development consortium, QEDs, and quantum leap challenge institutes, QLCI. Uh, actually, the, the QLCI, I have some uh, admiration for because they, I, those, at least uh, the ones I know about, are being run by very competent physicists who have been doing very interesting work uh, with quantum stuff for a long time. And so uh, I'm not sure they mean anything new. But I just want you to know that your, your government is aware that quantum is a, is a big thing. And uh, uh, the NGCO has a director. You know, this is, it has a deputy director. It has a senior policy advisor, a policy analyst, and a quantum liaison. Uh, these are actually people. The quantum liaison is a person, not a quantum. And they're all PhD scientists. And they, they presumably have an office uh, in the White House. Although the, you know, the White House, I think, extends well beyond the White House these days. Uh, and here are the agencies who are participating and are being coordinated. You know, the, the the NG, NQCO is not the only shield in the business. Uh, here are the executive office, Air Force, Army, DARPA, and so on. I mean, NASA, you can pick out a few of these things. The NIH is involved. Uh, NSF is and has been for a long time involved. But just, just so you know that your, your government is alert and hard at work. Although I have to say, I, I, I wonder if they people who voted for it. I mean, I thought Jerry asked a really good question. I, I wonder if the people who voted for the, the act uh, weren't expecting, you know, another atomic bomb advance or, um, you know, maybe even a hydrogen bomb, and something like that. Uh, and so where, uh, by spending a hell of a lot of money, you actually got a result. Uh, I'll be really interested to see this. Uh, I know that there's money in it for, you uh, 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 there's, there's money in it for Q through 12, uh, K through 12 education. There, there are already people, uh, I know some of them, are uh, setting up institutes to train high school teachers and elementary school teachers on the basic quantum concepts that they should be imparting to, you know, children and uh, young adults, because America has to be prepared. Um, okay. Well, 
back to the issue at hand, states and quantum superposition. And uh, uh, I, I'm giving you a definition of a state that Dirac gives. And I'm giving it partly uh, so you can see uh, what, a, uh, what an amorphous idea the state is. A state of a system may be defined as an undisturbed motion that is restricted by as many conditions or data as are theoretically possible without mutual interference or contradiction. In practice, the conditions could be imposed in passing the system it through various kinds of sorting apparatus, such as slits and polarimeters. So he's really got in his mind, I think, uh, systems that involve atoms and photons because you can, that's what you can do with them. You, you can send them through various kinds of crystals. But I, I read this as a state is whatever you've got before, during, and after doing whatever you've done to an entity or collection of entities, you know? And it's the whatever that makes this. Uh, uh, i give you an example uh, that might help, but if you make a, an electrical discharge in hydrogen gas, you, you will put, uh, hydrogen atoms uh, into one of the energy states that are shown in the diagram. And I'll show you the diagram in a second. And then it can change from that energy state to a lower one by emitting a photon. So let's see, where did they go? Uh, I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to come here. So here, here's something we talked about last time that uh, if you look at the light coming from hydrogen atoms, a bunch of them, you'll see a red line, you'll see a blue green line. Uh, you probably won't see uh, this one and you almost surely will not see this one because your eye just is not sensitive to that. Color film on the other hand is, uh, and, or, or digital is, and there's even another line right there that uh, if you look, you can see it. So most of these are not visible, certainly not to the, uh, adult eye. I've worked with students in the laboratory, and um, you know they can hear, they can hear audio frequencies I can't hear, and they can see uh, visual light frequencies that I can't see. But this is. I wanted you to see this uh, uh, diagram because it's an important kind of diagram. Uh, it's it's called an energy level diagram, and the the, the mental picture you have is that. If the electron uh, was in this up in energy states in this region, it's got uh, it's actually a free electron. It is not in fact bound to the proton. But as it uh, uh, gets sucked in, uh, it can end up uh, with, um, as we would say, in an energy state uh, here uh, or here or here or here, and in fact. Uh, they didn't show it in the picture because it breaks the scale. There's another one down here, which is the lowest one. Uh, they called, uh, they, they, these states are identified by numbers, which uh, are called quantum numbers. If you ever hear anybody talk about quantum numbers, it just means numbers that show up when you're talking about quantized systems. And the energy of the energy states of the hydrogen atom are given by this rather simple formula of minus 13.6 electron volts over n squared. So the lowest possible state is n equal one down here at minus 13.6 electron volts. And, and what that means is if you had an electron sitting right here uh, and it hitched up with a hydrogen atom, there's not anything really to prevent it from going, sort of getting sucked in and going clunk down here. It will have emitted a photon uh, with an energy of 13.6 electron volts. The minus sign means that if you want to get the electron off the hydrogen atom, you're going to have to supply at least 13.6 electron volts of energy to do it. Uh, of course, the electron could have ended up in this state, and if it, uh, uh, or it could have ended up, or maybe started uh, in a state right here. Uh, in which case it might have gone not all the way down here to this n equal one state. It, suppose it went from here to the n equal two state, or suppose it had come in here and went from here to the n equal two state and so on. These 
transitions shown by the arrow correspond to these light, these lines of spectrum that are shown up here. In other words, this one, the red one, is going from minus 1.51 EV to 3.4 EV. And if you figure that out, uh, that means it's going to emit a photon with an energy, which is the difference between these two, 1.9 EV. And 1.9 EV will come out with a wavelength of 656 nanometers. Similarly, if you were here and you drop down here, uh, out would come 486 nanometers and so on. And so it's, there, there are a lot of possible transitions. The diagram only shows the ones that produce light that's close, visible or close to it. And this is called the bomber spectrum because it was known long before anybody had a conception of how it might be produced. And, and now we have this kind of model in our heads of how it could be produced. So uh, uh, two, two things here, uh, kind of a lesson in how you can describe the energy, energetics of atoms and an and, and indication of how you can think of where the photon comes from. Photons come from transitions from high energy states to low energy states in atoms. You can make photons other ways, but these are, these are the ones that give you the nice line spectra that we're seeing here. Uh, and I think I've mentioned this before. The reason these things are lines is because the light is passed through a very narrow slit and then basically into some kind of prismatic device so that the red light is an image of a line over here and the blue light is image of a line uh, of a slit over here and so on. So what you're really seeing here is kind of images of a slit uh, deflected according to their color, uh, which we know how to do. Charlie, uh, if this were so severely quantized, mm. it would seem that the line, unless the equipment, of course, creates a splay, uh, that, that the line would be so thin that you shouldn't be able to see it unless this, unless the electrons are moving around it, as some relativity would, would, would make the line broader. Otherwise, if it was strictly quantized, it would be so thin you shouldn't be able to see it. Right. So, so you, there, there's a, there are all kinds of escape uh, hatches from that, uh, Jerry. First of all, uh, they aren't exactly sharp. That is, the, the, uh, th these levels are not exactly sharp. And it's, it's as though you can, have, uh, you can have transitions that go from sort of one part of this level to a different part of this level. And so there's going to be some width there. The other thing is the atoms themselves are moving around in this kind of setup with a heavy discharge, electrical discharge. Um, the, the atoms are moving, some of them are moving towards you, some are moving yeah, away, right, and you get right. Doppler shift, yeah. you get broadening of the lines. Uh, there's pressure, the atoms run into each other, uh, and so on. So th there are all kinds of reasons why there's going to be line width. And in the end, it turns out to be an intrinsic line width. <clears throat> there's an uncertainty principle for that. Uh, rather than position and momentum, there's an uncertainty principle for uh, the sharpness of energy and the lifetime of the state. In other words, the electron doesn't stay here forever. And, uh, and in fact, it's rather quickly, you know, sort of nanosecond kind of things. It's down here. And, and so there's always a width. Uh, and the apparatus also has a width. So it's always quantized except when it isn't? Well, I mean, I, I, what are you, aren't you satisfied? I mean, don't you, aren't you impressed that there's, there's this much difference between this energy and this one, and there's nothing in between. Oh, I am impressed with that. I was just thinking that that uh, if it was so, if we if we say that things are quantized, the quant I would think the quantum would be a very, very precise number, and nothing higher and nothing lower. No, never. I mean, certainly not as the energy states of these systems. There's well, it's like it's the same thing with like the momentum of a particle. Would you expect it to be really sharp? And, and you might. I would. But yeah, but that just means you don't know, uh, you don't have, you've don't. you got a physical system in which the location of the object with its momentum is spread all over the place. Uh, so there's uncertainty even to that? Yes. I got always. it now. I understand now. Okay. And, and so uh, I put a little circle around the ground of ground state because that's not the ground state. Uh, and I just was being... Uh, 
pedantic maybe. The ground state is the one that they didn't show in the diagram that I lifted off the internet. The ground state is down here at minus 13.6 EV. Um, I, I remember this. Well, and there's lots more physics uh, and it's fun in here. If you go and look at the ground state, it turns out it splits. There's a, there's a whole lot of uh, little tiny levels that are not far apart. Uh, it's called the fine structure. Uh, people have gotten Nobel prizes for figuring it out. Uh, these these lines often uh, are are split. So this this very historically important one that people had identified without even knowing what it was. This formula was kind of known without I mean, you can get it from quantum mechanics. Niels Bohr got it from sort of bad quantum mechanics, uh, but a high school teacher named Balmer got it by looking at the, uh, at the diagram and saying, oh, hey, look, you know, you could do it this way. And uh, uh, that was in, I think, in the 1880s. Uh, so it wasn't until the 1920s that we can actually uh, do this in a fully quantum mechanical way. And out through the 20s and 30s and uh, 40s and 50s, people are still finding out things about the minute details of structure in these levels. Uh, there's a lot of fun there, a lot of Nobel Prizes too. Anyway, the point I wanted to make here is that you, you begin to see what energy states are. I mean, I might call, I say, oh, the hydrogen atom is in the N equal to uh, uh, energy state. And, you know, people in the trade will know what that means. Uh, and, uh, uh, but there's more to it uh, than that. Um, let me see if I say, well, it just, it turns out that uh, all bound systems have quantized energies. Uh, one of the classics, the first thing you do in a quantum mechanics course is you, you do a particle in a box. Uh, and because we're physicists, we do it in a one dimensional box. And the reason we do it is because we can solve the equations. Uh, and I think it's maybe the only one we can solve the equations without having to do gymnastics. But, um, but I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, you can see how this works. Uh, here's, here are the energy levels of a particle in a box. And uh, if the particle is an electron, and I put down here, which has a mass of nine times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, uh, and the box is about a nanometer in length, that's about the size of an atom, then the ground state energy, uh, the lowest energy it can have will be uh, 0.38 electron volts. And, and that's exactly, or, you know, that isn't exactly, that is roughly the kind of energies you associate with electrons in atoms, the outer electrons, the, the electrons that do the chemistry. That's a, that's a nice chemical energy. And, and you get it just by, you say it's got to be that because it's, it's trapped, it's held by the electrical potential in the case of an atom, uh, not, the, not the walls of the box in the case of the diagram. Uh, but if I put a go golf ball, I thought, I better find this out. I mean, all the golfers here will be wanting to know when, you know, when the golf ball goes into the hole, uh, what energy state is it in? Um, and I said, oh, let's see. A golf ball weighs about 45 grams. And uh, the hole, because I didn't want to do anything complicated, is about 10 centimeters. Uh, that's about a tenth of a meter. And... Uh, so the ground state energy will be 7.6 times 10 to the minus 46 EV. Uh, it's just an example of why we never see quantization uh, in macroscopic objects, but it's also relieves you of the worry when you're playing golf of what the, you know, what energy state your ball will be and when it gets in there. Um, so uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, I, I want to, I want to do an experiment. I want to see if I can do some, I, uh, Charlie? yeah, Charlie? yeah. Uh, I, I just if you go back to go back to the, uh, spectral, uh, display slide. Sure. Uh, there was some questions that were asked and I think the answer was kind of <laughs> a little bit uncertainty principle, kind of an answer. If you pardon the experience. No, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, right. I mean, well, there, no, there are yeah. two things going on. There's, yeah, yeah. But, th there's but what plenty I'm saying of experimental is, uncertainty. That's built right. Into so, so you but, talked earlier about doing the experiment many times. That's what you're doing when you, when you have that, uh, 
display of the actual spectrum because you have Absolutely. gazillions of atoms that are emitting right. and some of them are uh, you know moving left some are moving right some are moving towards you some are moving away from you some yeah. are maybe in a you know I collision see, situation all that yeah. But what if you it? take it down to the level of having almost one atom, and they've done that now these, with these laser cooling and trapping yeah. experiments, you can get essentially a very pure emission for, yes. for that. Uh, typically, it's done in yeah. very high uh, uh, Rydberg state uh, atom where the, you have N equals you know, 70 or something like that, and it's a microwave right. photon. But, that, but is, the, that is all true. Yeah, uh, and, there, and, and, and it comes still, out pretty damn was, clean. Yeah, but there will still be a width. Oh yeah, but but it's but it's very very narrow. Oh yeah, well that's, yeah, so I mean, that, that people want to do all kinds of stuff to make them better. The but answer that's is that's not to, where I am. Yeah, the answer to to the to the to the question really is that the the spectral process is just crude. You're just seeing the typical spectrum of a right. excited gas or whatever. I You're think seeing I said that, just didn't a, I, Ted? an enormous number of, of that. Didn't I say that? Well, yeah, you did, but it was kind of in a confusing way. You okay. kind of backed into it, if you ask me, but that's okay. okay. Uh, I just, I just wanted to deal with that since uh, okay. I spent a fair amount of my uh, uh, physics career uh, looking at at uh, things coming uh, uh, emitted by glowing gases and stuff. So, yeah. Okay. No. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about polarization. Uh, we, we talked about photons. Uh, uh, and it turns out that uh, we can talk about the state of a photon. Um, and again, this idea of state is, is you know, quite uh, comprehensive in a way, because you can talk about the state of a photon in a two beam interferometer. Uh, you can talk about its um, state as being in one beam or the other, uh, you know, its state of a path being in a path. So, but, Photons also have another property. Uh, photons come uh, with an arrow. Photons are capable of polarization. We know they have to be because we know that polarization exists classically. We know that polarization uh, is a, uh, a phenomenon. Uh, uh, what Evan Land uh, made his fortune by first inventing a way to easily polarized light, but it's been known since the 19th century that um, light uh, can be polarized. It's very easy to understand polarization in terms of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic wave theory, because those are transverse waves. The electric field is oscillating up and down. And uh, so you can, you can imagine, as I've got here, a diagram of a uh, light wave with uh, of oscillations occurring in all different directions. Uh, and you put it through a, a filter, which only allows oscillations in this direction. And out comes a wave that is only oscillating in this direction, perpendicular to its direction of travel. That's, that's a polarized wave. We would say linearly polarized. And I'm going to stay away from the details. Uh, but it's interesting if I send it down here to a filter, uh, that has its transmission axis aligned with uh, vertical polarization, then the photons will go right through. On the other hand, if I were to rotate piece of two so that the transmission axis is perpendicular to the plane of oscillation of the wave, uh, it will be absorbed and won't go through. And uh, and I'll, this I can I can also do things like well I'll show you. The, the first thing uh, I can show is polarization uh, in two directions. So uh, I have here a, uh, a piece of Polaroid film. This is the kind of thing that Edwin Land uh, invented, I think, when he was an undergraduate at Harvard. Let me, I'm moving this around. Oh, oh, come on. Ah, there we go. Uh, you know, this is just uh, essentially stretched molecules in a uh, 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 the, 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 the time latency is a killer. Uh, there we go. 
anyway, so you see um, th this piece of plastic has uh, is, is polarized so that it will transmit, um, I'm sorry, will absorb uh, anything that's oscillating in the direction parallel to this edge. See, I'm not doing this very well. This is tough. So let me get on with it. Charlie, you're a little bit off center. If you could. I know it. I'm, I'm trying to get back on. It's, it's hard because I move it and then it takes about uh, 10 seconds before I see the motion, the effect of the motion. Um, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's like trying to manipulate something remotely on the moon from the earth, maybe. Uh, okay. So I put my polarizer on top of it and the light that's coming out is now polarized. And you can see if I, if I put this piece of plastic, let's see, where can I do it? Yeah, this piece of plastic, do it like that, on it, uh, it's polarized in the opposite direction. So uh, you get complete extinction, as we say. Well, you don't get complete extinction, but it does a good job. And you see, if I were to rotate this thing 90 degrees, so that it's allow its transmission axis is parallel to the transmission axis of this. Now I get. Now I can see the printing again. Now uh, what's uh, let me do it. Yeah, I'll do it like that. One of the things that's kind of interesting, and I just want to do it, is I have yet another polarizer here, and I'm going to insert it between these two, you see, I, at, the, at the moment, it's completely extinguished. And uh, I'm gonna send this one in. And you'll notice, let's see, maybe you won't notice. Huh. I can't do it, let's see. Oh, no, the latency is just killing me. All right. All right, not, not dramatic enough to be worth doing. I apologize. So on to the other point. Uh, the other point is there are ways to take polarized light and uh, uh, split it into two beams. Um, and when you do that, you see what's happening is that um, the, the word polarized is, uh, is doubled there. Actually, the crystal has got enough cracks in it, so it's not so easy to see, is it? Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. And uh, and you can see that what's happened is the crystal is, is um, it's birefringent. It is refracting the light that comes up from the printing. Uh, the one direction of polarization is bent through the crystal slightly different than the other. And when that happens, you're seeing it when it's double. I mean, it's not, it's not due to drink. Uh, it's just that that's the way. So now if I put the Polaroid on top, you'll see one of the image goes away. If I rotate it around, then the other image is transmitted. So anyway, I just wanted, I, it's partly to see if I could do a demonstration. I'm, I'm gonna rate that as pretty much unsuccessful, except that uh, I wanted to make the point that you can uh, um, that you, that you can uh, take a beam of unpolarized light, put it through an apparatus, and get out two beams from it uh, polarized, uh, as we would say, at right angles to each other. One say vertically, and the other horizontally. Anyway. I was trying to do cross polarizers demonstration because when it's set up, it's very nice to see that you can have two polarizers that are 
uh, exhibiting full extinction, then you put a third polarizer in between them at an angle and you get transmission. And the idea is to be surprised that adding a third component between two that are blocking the light actually produces transmission. Um, but if I can't do it, uh, it's hard for you to be surprised. Uh, and then polarized beam splitter demonstration, that kind of worked. I showed you that there are ways to get two, uh, to get a beam of unpolarized light into two beams. All right, just to remind you that a photon interferes with itself, um, here's the experiment that we like to do, uh, shown very schematically. Uh, it's possible to use a crystal and put into it a beam from a laser uh, say 480 nanometers and get out. So put in a photon with a corresponding to a wavelength of say 480 nanometers and get out, um, I guess, let's do it 420 because then I think I get it right. Uh, and get out two photons, each of 840. Uh, and then go off in different directions. And in effect, you have tagged this photon with the other photon. And it's a way, uh, so if this photon comes into your interferometer, and this is what we talked about last time, and goes through the system, uh, and you detect it in coincidence with a the photon there, you know that you only had one photon in the system. Um, it's the photon that is correlated with the one that went back here. So you do a, uh, and, and here with this interferometer, you can move this mirror back and forth a little bit. That changes the path length of this, it changes the length of this path compared to the length of this path. And your coincidences go up and down accordingly as there is uh, interference. That is a single photon passing through the system and being detected in coincidence with this photon will, as you make a mirror go back and forth, I should have said single photons going individually, will make coincidences that have a pattern that varies like this, an interference pattern. This is the experimental verification of Dirac's assertion uh, back in 1930 that a photon always interferes with itself. Uh, I wanted it here also just to make again the point about states of the system. We can talk about the state of a photon being in this branch of the interferometer. We can talk about the state being in that branch of the interferometer. But when we're going to describe this whole system, we end up saying that the actual state is the superposition of those two states that I talked about, that the photon is a superposition of this one and this one, and that uh, it is the resolution of that at the end that um, it is the detection of that at the end that produces this pattern. There's just a there's just a cartload of difficulties in in that explanation, uh, and I'll come back to some of those in a minute. Uh, but it, it also contains the essence of uh, the difficulties of quantum theory. Uh, but the thing I'm most important that I wanted to establish is uh, this idea of superposition of states. Because quantum superposition is very different from classical supervision, superposition. And it's very disturbing. You know, you've all heard Einstein uh, deploring uh, spooky action at a distance. Uh, you, you probably all have heard of Schrodinger's cat. It's a kind of almost a popular icon. It often is missed that Schrodinger sort of imagine a cat both dead and alive living in a superposition of alive and dead states because he was trying to show vividly how ridiculous the quantum theory seemed to him uh, and believe i i have the quote and he said i uh i i wish i never had invented this uh, when he was looking at it so i thought you'd all like to see that in the garden of Hutenstrasse 9 in Zurich, where Schrodinger lived from five years, uh, there is this little statue in the back and that it's 
very ingeniously uh, constructed so that depending on the light conditions, the cat appears uh, either alive or dead. So as the day goes on, I guess it morphs from live to dead. I, I, I lifted this off of the internet. Uh, I would like to see the other picture. I mean, this looks like it's live to me. Uh, Interestingly, if you if you go and you read uh, uh, Rovelli, uh, the book, one of the books I recommended at the beginning, you will find that he is very delicate, I guess, because he he says uh, I, I can't talk about uh, the cat dying uh, so miserably, and so instead he has the cat going to sleep, and so he has a cat which is in a superposition of uh, alive and asleep. Uh, I felt I felt there was a undue sensitivity, but that's me. All right. So you can superpose all kinds of things, and and therein lies the trouble. Uh, I'm going to go back and just talk a little bit. Um, Dirac says it nicely. He says, you know, suppose you've got a system uh, that's in. You've got a system A and you're uh, going to make a measurement on the system and you're always going to get little a and then he says suppose you have another system b and you're going to make a measurement on it and you're always going to get little b and we can make systems like that i mean that is we can make uh, we could make hydrogen atoms always in exactly the same energy state so that every time you measure a hydrogen atom you would find it in that energy state in, in a way uh, and, and there are other situations. We can make a polarization state so that every time we measure the state of the light, it's always in that polarization state. The photons are always in that state. This, however, is not the usual setup, uh, not the usual circumstance. Uh, you, you can superpose states so that if you can, if you had this state capital A, which has the quantity little a that gets measured, uh, you can superpose it with B. You can have a combination state of capital A plus capital B. Uh, and you can do this quite arbitrarily with the, I mean, in, in principle, you could make hydrogen atoms that are super are in an energy state, which is a superposition of several of those energy levels that I showed you before. That's very different from classical superposition. But it's even more different because if you make a measurement on a system, one of these superposed systems, if you make a measurement on capital A superposed with capital B, you will always get either A or B. You won't know which one you're going to get until you measure. So you, somehow or other, the measurement results in the outcome. outcome. And now you begin to get into the really uncomfortable parts of quantum mechanics, because uh, this is, again, what Feynman is talking about when he says you can set up an experiment, you're going to make a measurement in the experiment, and you will get different results on different occasions when you do the experiment. So A and B then come with different probabilities, and it's what I said earlier, you can make a complete characterization of the system. Uh, only after you measure many, many examples. Now, that's very disturbing in many ways. I mean, you say, um, because it, it comes to a point where you're saying, suppose I have the superposed system, A plus B, or the hydrogen atom in in many different energy states, or the photon in a superposition of different polarization states. Suppose I have the setup like that, um, and I make my measurement. Um, what happens to the system? I mean, what, what do I mean? Certainly, as soon as I have extracted a value of polarization from the polarization state of the photon, uh, the photon is now in that state. But it wasn't in that state before, it was in the superposition state. So 
so this superposition, but many, you know, in the, in the early days of quantum mechanics, you would, people wanted to say, well, oh, come on. You know, it was certainly in a particular polarization state and you just didn't know which one it was in. And you made a measurement and it was in that one. The, the, but the, the famous case of Bertelmann socks comes to mind. So Bertelmann is a physicist in Vienna who uh, since his teenage rebellious years uh, wore socks of different colors. And uh, you, you, know, you knew if you saw one sock on Bertelmann of a certain color that the other sock would be of a different color. And uh, so you, you can imagine quantum socks um, in which are in a superposition of two colors, say orange and green. Um, now, you make a measurement, you're going to get orange and you're going to get green or green. You, you don't know which. Um, and now what you can do, uh, though, is you can superpose, and this is where superposition um, causes Schrodinger to be unhappy, causes Einstein to be unhappy. You can superpose uh, a, a sock which is in a you can, you, can, you can get a pair of socks together and you can build a superposition of their states such that one sock will come out orange and the other will come out green. Or if the first one comes out green, then the other comes out orange. And that is a kind of superposition which is called entanglement. And you'll have heard of entanglement before. It's a consequence of superposition. And, and people will still want to say, well, come on, the, the system, orange and green socks, it was surely one or the other. And then you measured and found out which it was. Quantum mechanics is not consistent with that view. Quantum mechanics uh, for, for many years, uh, people argued about whether the measurement itself collapsed the wave function, that was jargon. The measurement itself created the observation. We're still arguing about that, but we're not arguing about as much as we used to because it used to be that the answer was, oh, you can't tell. There's no experiment that you can do that will dis distinguish between a situation where the superposition of, a, of an orange green sock uh, is not actually an orange sock and you just didn't know, but was actually this combination until you measured it and then it became an orange sock. That we can now, thanks to John Bell in 1964, show uh, is not consistent with quantum mechanics, the theory and uh, consequently the reality. So here I do something which is, uh, I think worth trying. Um, let me, um, John Bell, um, let's see if I, yeah. So John Bell uh, realized something which when you learn about it and can finally understand what it is he's talking about, is extremely simple. Uh, he realizes that if you have a set of objects that have three different properties, and I've called them A, B, and C. And if you group the objects according to their distinct well-defined properties, and I'm gonna show you an example in a minute so you understand what I'm talking about. Then he says, for example, th they, there will be certain inequalities that must be satisfied by the groupings of the objects. So here's one. He says, suppose you've got something that's property A, property B, and property C and you look at the collection and you count how many of these things have property A and don't have property B. And you count how many things have property B and don't have property C. And the sum of those two things will always be greater than or equal to the number of things that have property A and don't have property C. Now, well, let's go back and see what I'm talking about when I'm talking about properties. So. Um, I used to, when I was rich and had a pocket full of money, I could do this experiment. Uh, take penny, uh, 
uh, I would call state A is means that the I have a bunch of coins, and state A is that the coin is copper colored, uh, and state not A means it's silver. It's a quarter or a dime or a nickel. And B is that it has a date before 1995, and not B is it has a date of 1995 or later. And C is I plunk these things all down on the counter, and it's heads up. C is heads on the table, and C is tails up or heads down on the table. So those are the properties. So then I just lay out a bunch of coins, and, and here they are. Penny, nickel, quarter, dime, nickel, penny, quarter, penny, quarter, nickel, penny, 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 quarter, nickel. And uh, and the date on the coin is given here, 1993. So 1993, that's a, that's a B. And so he's got a state B. Uh, and uh, he's heads up. And so he's a C. And he's a penny, so he's copper colored. So he's an A. So the state of this coin is A, B, C. And the nickel. 1989, so again, he's a B, uh, but he's silver, so he's a not A. And he's heads up, so he's a C, and so on. I go down through all the coins. And now I look at these things, and if you remember, the Bell inequality that I was examining is that uh, the sum of A and not B, and B and not C, will always be greater than or equal to the so, uh, to A's and not C's. And so I have to go down through my list here uh, and I see, oh, here's A and not B. So I got one and I go down some more uh, and I don't have any more A's and not B's. So I count for A not B as one. Uh, so here's, uh, well, here's where, okay. Here's a B not C. Here's another B not C, so I got two. Here's another B not C, so I got three. So I add those three up and they're gonna be four. Three and one is four, I'm good on that. What about A not C? Well, if I go down here, uh, I have to find A, that's an A, that's an A and a not C. So there's one. Oh, there's A and not C, that's two. Um, there's A and not C, that's three. Okay. Bell inequality satisfied. Three and one is four, and four is definitely greater than or equal to three. So that's that's kind of the story here. The number of A's and not B's, and the number of B's and not C's is greater than the number of A's and not C's. Bell inequality. Um, Charlie? Yeah. Quick question. What if you uh, had A and not B plus B, not B and not C, and you add those probabilities together? What do you get? I don't know. Uh, okay. I would have to. I'd have to think about it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, th this one is set up so that I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> and and just just so you can get a sense of, uh, in a way, I mean, he, he he's just saying this is. Uh, you can go through a formal logic proof to to show these inequalities must be so, and uh, uh, but uh, this is kind of a nice way to get a physical feeling that it's all right. So here's a Venn diagram. I mean, so here's A. Uh, and here's B and here's C. And you see the shaded region? That's the shaded region. That's A and not B. So we don't include the part of B that overlaps with A. And over here we have B and not C. And again, same thing. And then over here we have A and not C. And I mean, you can, you can kind of see that no matter how you move these circles around, it, it's quite plausible that A not B plus B not C will always have to be greater than A not C. As I say, you can do a formal logic proof and work it all out. You know, and then in, in a way, it's, it, as I say, it's it's a little confusing when you come across it the first time, but it's a very simple idea, but it took until 1964 for somebody to come up with it and understand that this provided a test of quantum mechanics and whether quantum mechanics was uh, valid or not. And so I go here to uh, just, well, uh, if I were gonna go through the, the numerical details of this, uh, we would have to know this stuff about photons going through uh, uh, various kinds of filters. But here's, here's what I'm, I will show you. So this is 
what we would call a, um, a polarizing beam splitter. Uh, and uh, this is a source of photons. And I can, uh, I can orient this thing so that uh, transmit uh, something that's polarized in the horizontal plane will be transmitted through it. And, uh, uh, and I can orient this crystal, this crystal, so that something that's in that plane will be reflected down. Uh, or I can uh, do it here. I can arrange it so this crystal transmits something which is uh, horizontally uh, polarized, and this one does. So I got I got these games that I can play with the crystals, and I can arrange it so that something comes out this way and something comes out that way. Each of these things is a state. I mean, this, uh, if I've got my crystals set up like this uh, and I get a coincidence between here and here, uh, I don't actually have to measure the polarization. See, I'm not measuring the polarization here. Uh, I'm, I, I'm observing a photon come out and a photon come out here and a photon come out here. Uh, and if I get photons coming out from both crystals at the same time, I can measure this one and find, oh, it's horizontal. So then I know what this one is. Uh, or uh, basically I can uh, set up a coincidence uh, detector. So that if I detect a photon from here and from here at the same time, I know they're both horizontal. So I'm, I'm not giving you enough information here for you to follow this in detail because I want to finish, but I also want to uh, show you a kind of uh, trick that, uh, no, not trick, it's an actual experiment in which uh, you set up the crystals uh, so that, let's see, I got it right? No, that's the end, that's the last one. Let me go back, all right. All right, so what I can do is uh, I can have a state A of something which is linearly polarized in a, in a given direction. And I can have a, a state B uh, where something is polarized uh, relative to a filter that's tilted at 30 degrees. And I can have a state C where something is polarized with respect to an axis at 60 degrees. Now I left off all the numbers the, the, earlier. I was saying that uh, if I set up one of these apparatuses with uh, photons that can be detected in coincidence, uh, I can arrange it so that a photon that has been labeled as A and not B uh, is coming out of the system. And I can predict what fraction of the photons that are being generated from that little yellow ball that was in the middle, I can predict what fraction of those photons uh, I will be detecting uh, in coincidences. And the answer for A not B is one eighth. And the answer for B uh, and C is again one eighth. B not C is again one eighth. But if I look at A not C, the polarization comes out three eighths. If I add one eighth and one eighth together, that is not greater than three eighths. Quantum mechanics violates Bell's inequality. Quantum mechanics correctly predicts these fractions. Quantum mechanics violates Bell's inequality. What are the assumptions that go into Bell's inequality? There is only one assumption in Bell's inequality, the assumption is that the object has a definite property. It has a property A, or it has a property not A, uh, or it has a property A. Uh, yeah, I leave it at that. Bell's inequality is not valid. Quantum mechanics is valid. Uh, then the object must not have a definite property until after you measure. You know, that's why Schrodinger said, I, don't, I wish I'd never invented this. That's probably a good place for me to stop.
Uh, but I would start. I would. I would add one little coda. Um, this turns out to be potentially quite useful. Um, there are a lot of systems for encryption that are extremely difficult to break. I mean, the, our basic encryption system works on the factorization of large numbers being difficult. Uh, but with this kind of a setup, uh, with polarizers and superposition of polarization states, and the fact that there is no definite polarization state until you measure, you can build an encryption system that is absolutely unbreakable. And people, you won't be surprised. In fact, you guys probably know this better than I do, are working hard to do that. That's why you've got a national quantum uh, information act. Uh, nobody's really interested in uh, Bell's inequality. They're interested in encryption systems. Um, and that is probably a good place. Because I think I promised when I started that if I did three pieces of quantum mechanics, I could leave you with some of the basic ideas, uh, but that if we got into the place where these were gonna be used uh, for practical purposes, I just don't know much about it. And therefore you need somebody else. But at that point, I think I can stop. If there are more questions, happy to answer. And I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can actually see what's going on. All right, Charlie, I have a question. Yeah, once go ahead. This was passed to me by John. He wanted me to ask this. Uh -huh. um, how does this apply to a quantum computer? Um, so you're used to uh, bits that are either one or zero. And, I, I, and in a way, Steve, I, I think I, I, I've tried to duck that right from the start because I don't understand it well myself. But I do understand this. You got uh, bits are one or zero, but a quantum bit is not. A quantum bit is both one and zero. Uh, that's what we call qubits. And um, you know, Shore has shown that with such qubits, you can make an algorithm that will, I think, factor uh, large numbers way faster than anything we can do with an ordinary computer. So, so that's the kind of answer I have to give. Uh, there are other things going on. Um, you know, I, I, th I think if you have half an idea, uh, you can get a piece of $2.6 billion without a lot of trouble. How quickly in the superposition of states does, en does entanglement occur? Well, um, I mean, in the, in the cases that I know, again, I. I I only know a few ways to entangle things, and uh, but I keep reading that it's it's way more common than we thought, and it's not that hard to do. But the cases I know, uh, they're entangled right away. I mean, you you create a, a photon pair uh, out of a certain uh, setup crystal setup, and those two photons uh, are uh, entangled from the get go. But how do we know that they're entangled until we do the measurement? Um, I think. Um, well, let me think. I, I don't know that I can answer that, Dick. I mean, I think. Um, no. Yeah, it's, it's something I've been I've been worried of, not worried, thinking Dan, about. Dan, can I see Dan is there? Dan, can you answer that? Well, it it depends on how you prepare your system. Yeah. For instance, well, with, with a hydrogen atom has an electron and a proton, and both of them have spin. And the spins are like the uh, polarization direction in light. You can have them parallel or anti-parallel, or you can have them entangled in one pointing up and the other pointing down. You can, you can separate out these states in a magnetic field, and you can see very easily the state where they're both pointing in the same direction or in opposite, uh, or in the same direction, whatever the direction is. And you can look at the state which has the entanglement of both of the up and down. And you, you don't know exactly what that entanglement, you don't know what the entanglement is. It's a combination of up and down. 
you can then prepare the state where you do know that. You make further measurements and then you can see the, the spins separately. But that's a new experiment and you're starting by preparing an unknown system right. in one which is known. So it's all a matter of your starting point. If you start right. an entangled system, it'll stay entangled. If you, uh, if you start with pure systems, they're not entangled and you can entangle them. Yeah, the reason I asked the question is I just came across <clears throat> just randomly like a week or two ago, what's called open quantum systems. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, mean, I mean, you guys probably know more about this than I do because I just started looking at it. But that has to do with entanglement. It has to do with measurements too. And so what's happening here is that the superposition occurs because you're taking a system that you're trying to measure, but it is interacting with its environment. And then you're making the measurements. So you're really, it, it's making, to me, superposition a little bit more hazy than I used to think of it from the direct point of view. Oh, um, well, yeah. I can't help you much there, Dick. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. Sure, I, I just want to make one comment. Um, I have not gone back and looked at Derek's book, um, but I will try because. <laughs> That seems to have been very rewarding. Yeah. Generally, in, in physics, um, among theorists, Dirac's book is uh, regarded as um, a masterpiece through its logic and its writing. And in 1935, um, no, 1932, Norman Ramsey, who was then a student at Columbia, got a graduate fellowship to Cambridge University. And there he heard lectures by Dirac. And um, I asked him about, about Dirac as a lecturer. And he said, well, he, he was just terrible. He just read his book. Now, if you learn more about Dirac, you can see why he did that. The book was perfect. <laughs> if he said something else, it would have been less than perfect. Well, I, I remember the story of uh, people used to say they much preferred the, to have read Heisenberg's papers than Dirac's because they would read a Dirac paper and there was just nothing you could add to it. There was nothing you could do with it. Whereas Heisenberg had all kinds of sloppy things and it was very easy to find ways to improve and uh, embellish on it. Yeah. So... So, yeah, I mean, the Dirac stories are quite wonderful. I mean, he was obviously, uh, do you think he was Asperger's? Yeah, I mean, he had a very, uh, I think, difficult upbringing. His father was kind of a martinet. He made the boys speak French at home. Uh, they were not allowed to speak English. His father was Swiss, but they were being raised in England. Um, and, and it is thought that uh, Dirac's inclination to silence may have come from that kind of an upbringing. Uh, yeah, it was very bizarre. His uh, older brother committed suicide. I had forgotten that. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it really was sort of a pathological um, situation there, but Dirac was just forced inward and he thought this all out by himself while in, in Europe, uh, people were talking to each other. So, so, yeah. so the, the story is that he went to visit Niels Bohr and mm -hmm. uh, Niels Bohr wrote home complaining that uh, Dirac just did not interact much. And someone told him the story of the parrot who uh, was bought and did not talk. And when he took it back to the pet shop, the pet shop owner said, well, I didn't, I sent you a thinker, not a talker. And... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, after a conference, he was sitting at a table with a couple of other people and there was lively conversation except for Dirac who just sat there and someone said, Dirac, why don't you speak up? And he said, it is my observation that uh, Many people talk, few people listen. 
Uh, another Dirac story is sitting uh, in a room, uh, someone came up making chit chat and said, uh, uh, it's a nice day. Uh, and Dirac looked at him and got up and walked across the room, looked out the window, and then came back and sat down and said, yes. <laughs> uh, Jerry has a question. Uh, yeah, uh, this is more important than encryption. Uh, it's about gold and the, me the metal gold. Gold is um, it's on the uh, sixth line of the periodic table, and its two outer shells have have lots of electrons, and they have a lot of subshells. Now, gold is not a color of the spectrum. It's it's a mixture of of this and that uh, to give the impression or to give the the ultimate. Uh, uh, visualization of, of the color gold. Although if you make it hot enough, if you change it in its environment, it becomes white. Uh, those electrons are moving up and down within the shells. There's more subshells to, to create lots of photons coming out. Is that basically a, a footnote to this lecture? So, so, I mean, you're talking about, uh, I mean, gold looks gold because of reflected light, right? So well, it's a, right, it's but absorbing. the light goes into the gold and comes off the gold. Right. Yeah, but, but I mean, it, it, you know, so the gold is filtering the light that goes in. It's absorbing yes. certain frequencies and uh, reflecting others back. Through its electrons, right? Uh, yeah, I presume. So they're moving within the shells as they oh, go sure. up and down well, the, the subshells. You remember the clouds? They like in the yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right, right, yeah, right. There's no, there's no, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. But well, it's like your, it's like your diagram showing them them dropping up and down. Yeah, uh, the, the electron. Oh, well, when you get into the surface, there's a whole lot of stuff. It's not, it's no longer isolated atoms. The level structures are different. The, there's a bunch of stuff going on, Jerry. Uh, you know, as a also, uh, as a nuclear physicist, I go ahead, Mike. Yeah, but also when you look look at the gold, you're not illuminating it with a monochromatic source it's being you're you're seeing it with with many many wavelengths that are being reflected yeah can i can i be heard sure earlier i was having difficulty i was going to tell charlie that i it didn't look like his slideshow was progressing but anyway i and did my it? comment my comment about gold i when you get into the heavier transition metals the energy levels, particularly of their D and higher orbital I, levels, the energy levels get spaced closer and closer until by the time you get into the inner transitions, I, the lanthanide and actinide series, the energy levels are almost equivalent, almost equivalent. And I, it's really difficult to distinguish between them experimentally or optically. Thank you, Bob.